Whew. <clears throat> Our next speaker is David Page, firefighter, street medic, and a researcher. He's just a wonderful guy. He's a great instructor and honestly, just a really funny man. Uh, in an age where everybody's so guarded about what they say, David's refreshingly very direct. He calls it as he sees it, the balls and strikes, and he lets you be the judge. He isn't reckless, um, but however, he's done the work. He can back up his insights, and he's earned the accomplishments that he's accumulated. Now a really quick overview of David's professional history. Uh, David is a nationally registered paramedic. He's the director of the pre-hospital research uh, forum at UCLA. He's a field paramedic with Alina EMS in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. He serves as the chair of the International Paramedic Registry, and with more than 35 years of EMS and street experience, the thing he still loves the most is just being out on the ambulance on the street, teaching, uh, uh, taking care of patients. Friends and family, fasten your seatbelts and welcome today's featured speaker, David Page. Good morning. You're my people. Buenos dias. Good morning. All right. D Doug Mitchell was absolutely right. I'd rather be in the back of an ambulance than up on this stage. So it's sort of like a national registry uh, station, you know. Uh, when I go like this, what do you think? What do you think? BSI, BSI. And then, and then what do you say? Scene safe. All right. The scene is not safe this morning. I am humbled. Thank you, GEMS and uh, FDIC, for inviting me. This is really just an honor. And, and uh, to be in front of you, my sisters, my brothers, uh, our entire family, our EMS Fire family, is uh, really uh, just, you know, you, you think about the, the kinds of, you have your family of origin, right? And then you have your chosen family. This is our chosen family. A family that bonds in a way that's difficult to explain, right? Uh, sometimes we spend more time with our EMS and fire family than we do with our own family, actually. Um, we work holidays. Other people are out enjoying themselves. We kind of go, well, maybe I can go over to the station and skip out on this uh, mother-in-law situation. Who knows? Now we spend time crammed inside system status mismanagement vehicles all over the place. We cook, we break bread together. And more importantly, we witness the human experience, seeing how people live and how they die. That makes this intentional family an experience that's deeper and sometimes unshareable with others. Well, we're coming out of a dark period. Nobody expected suddenly to be in what we were, right? I have to admit that more than once over the past years, couple of years now, I just wondered in this pandemic, what in the world am I doing? 35 years and I'm sporting a Tyvek suit or garbage bag, inside out coat, <laughs> respirator. <sighs> you know, during COVID, I think all of us who worked out there felt that incredible pressure. We separated patients from their families fearing that it was the last time that some of them would hug each other. It's one thing to say to the family, hey, meet your loved one at the hospital. Do not underestimate that emotional toll in an unknown situation. Did, were we going to bring it back to the family? Undressing in the garage? My neighbors are like, what? And yet, when the enemy is invisible, undetectable, it's a molecule that's floating around the back of the box, playing Russian roulette with our lives. 
Is it going to get me? Is, it gonna, is this it? It puts an entire new meaning to that national registry. Is the scene safe? Did you know that the environmental engineers were worried about us, actually? They did a study. They started to check the airflow in the back of ambulances, right? And so they did this research. Sometimes research is just this dirty word. We're going to try and fix that today. So they do this research to help us. If somebody sneezes and coughs, what happens? What happens to the germs that are floating around in the back? Do you know? Well, we've got a ventilator on. We think we're evacuating all the air. In fact, hmm. Now, mind you, the ambulance is the least safe vehicle per mile driven than any other vehicle on the road today. That should make everybody feel a little bit more comfortable. But it's really about you know, lights and sirens, and I digress. Let's go back to ventilation, right? Airway breathing ventilation. So, <laughs> did you know that in this study they found that unlike airplanes, hospitals, what we actually have in the back of the ambulance is like a little whirlwind tornado. It like makes sure that it makes three passes around the back of the ambulance just so all the germs can get all over us and we breathe as much of it in. If we're going to go, we might as well just go, right? Wow. Wow. Thank goodness we are emerging from this, right? How good is it to be here in person? Oh, come on. Come on. We get to be together. We are resilient. We are tenacious. In fact, I'm going to quote a little bit of Tupac Shakur about growing roses in concrete where conditions are such that you would think we could not survive. And yet, we do. We survive, we learn, we grow. We seek the sun, we seek the light. And who are we to look at that rose and critique its petals. We need to celebrate it, right? Is the scene safe? Well, I want to talk a little bit about Chief Alan Brunacini, Bruno, because he inspired me. Now, some of you, you saw him in the video. Some of you uh, know him as America's fire chief and God rest his soul. Uh, 50 years with Phoenix Fire. He left us 2017, 80 years old. Too young, really. He had so much more to give. Inventor of blue card systems, promoter of the NFPA. He really did amazing things. And he had a tenant. Do you know it? Safety, right? Service, smiles. Today I'm going to add science. Safety, service, smiles, science. I met Chief Brunacini at a conference in Michigan on crew resource management. I count myself lucky to have met him, uh, incredible man, learned from him, taught with him. And, um, and we were doing this thing on CRM. Who knows CRM? Raise your hand if you know CRM, right? Right, all of us should be raising our hands and cheering. Crew resource management, safety, service, and smile. So let's talk about safety for a minute. I think it's more, it's critical. It's just critical that we make it home in one piece. And not just in one piece physically, because that's what we all think, right? Is the scene safe? But also psychologically, right? We have to have that heads up checkup. Are we okay? Otherwise, what good are we to our service, to our families, and most importantly, to ourselves? Right? So safety isn't just about the big bad guy with a gun. It's about what we do, what we say to ourselves, 
when, that, when we emerge from that bad call, when we emerge from the most difficult shift just because we were uh, in, a, in a garbage bag faced with a whole bunch of microbes. So I'm on a quest to make safety less fuddy duddy and more like sexy. All right? So, um, you know, I think if we, if we could think of it like sexy, maybe, well, I know a lot of my partners wouldn't stop thinking about it, right? And then if it were sexy, maybe we'd study it, maybe we'd get good at it, we'd practice it. Um, so, you know, if science were sexy, wow, that'd be cool. How am I doing so far? Is it sexy? No. Well, in 2012, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration, Dr. Sabina Braithwaite, did a great job of outlining a strategy for a culture of safety. It's been a decade. It's been a decade. Ask me where we are with a culture of safety. Again, not just physical, in our heads too. Ask me where we are with implementing a system, systematic approach. And I am sorry to tell you, we're not there. We need that systematic approach. You know CRM, if you know it, shout it. Closed loop communication, right? Teamwork, blameless error reporting and near miss reporting. Let's catch it before it happens. Let's not let our friends trip and step into the same potholes that we did. Humility, flat hierarchies, situational awareness, human factors engineering, and enlisting patients to be partners in their own care taking personal responsibility and sharing that responsibility, having accountability and follow through, not just with ourselves, but also connecting with leaders and personnel so we don't have this, well, their management, their dispatch, they don't know, they don't know the street. By all metrics, in all of healthcare, okay, so it's not just us, so let's just say in all of healthcare, <laughs> We are iatrogenically responsible for 100 to 250,000 deaths. That's medical error for you in the IOM report. 250 plus thousand people, and we're part of that. In, the, in some studies, we have a greater than 50% error in medication administration. Ah, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, just a little more epi. Well, what could happen? Unacceptable, my sisters and brothers. Unacceptable. Kudos to Sedgwick County EMS. They tried to fix this a little bit. They said, you know, what could we do to, you know, make this a little better? They established a non-punitive system so nobody would get in trouble if they reported a near miss or an error. They report errors averted, and they got to an accuracy rate of 99.7%. That is an error rate of 0.3%. Amazing, right? Amazing. Wouldn't I love to have an error rate of 0.3%? Wow. Now, I want you to think about that for a minute. Is that acceptable? On the screen is a heat map of flights in the United States. These are, prior pandemic was about 87,000 each day in 2005. Today, about 45,000, okay, give or take. So an error rate of 0.3% in aviation would be 135 flights crashing every day. 135. See the eastern seaboard light up across the country. Each dot is an aircraft. 135. Who wants to fly home today? Yeah. But the thing is, aviation, using crew resource management, communication, teamwork, they cleaned their act up. They created a culture of safety, right? This is a culture of checklists. This is a culture where we simply don't fly if it's not safe. And it is one of the most error-free, or should I say, error-catching 
industries in the world. EMS and fire need to embrace crew resource management fully from the street on all the way up. We need to report those near misses and errors in a way that is non-punitive. You know it. You look at the rig and you go, huh, who was driving last night? That dent was not there before. Who, who, not what, not what, not how can we prevent the system, but who? We find the culprit, we scapegoat the person. We need to research the root cause, measure, re, re, re measure, right? And make a systematic change based on evidence, data, so that it does not reoccur and hurt somebody else. Safety, service, and smiles, and science. So let's talk about service for a minute. For too long, service equals sacrifice, right? We're proud of that. Well, sacrificing our health, especially our mental health, racing to save a life. But Brunacini didn't really see that version of service as its entirety. In fact, he embraced the concept of the community being a partner to us, the public servants. They could depend on us no matter what. They took care of that fire service because the fire service took care of them. Well, emergency medical services, services. It's not about the lights and the siren, which by the way, the science is telling us really matter in very, very few circumstances, if at all. So it's really about serving, serving our communities, no matter what the need. We love our traumas. Wow, we delight. when we resuscitate somebody, that is like, wow. From dead to alive, we triumphed. We won. And yet, really it's about service. We have for too long seen inequities of service for underrepresented, underserved, underfunded populations. We have to do better. It's time we admit that saving lives is part of what we do, but it's not like 90% of our job. We'll be prepared for that part. But serving our community means alleviating pain. It means helping others, wherever they are, however it is, to get care. Care being the operated word, the operative word. And we need, to, we need to do this for all of our communities, regardless of their gender, their socioeconomic status, their ethnicity, their language, their belief system. Celebrate our people, no matter where they're coming from. I'm old enough to remember when we were encouraging people to call 911. It's like, if you have a problem, call 911. Well, dirty little secret. It worked! People call 911. And then we're like, oh, you call 911 for this? at three in the morning? Well, we are there to help frighten mom with her child's emergency, even if it wasn't enough of an emergency. Safety, smiles, service, right? Let's talk about smiles. Bruno said, be nice. Well, we relish in our stories of glory, right? And sometimes we have a little bit of a twisted sense of humor. But that great sense of humor is what actually helps people through that crisis. We see the good where other people see darkness. And we are able to help a child forget about their open fracture, or a grandma with dementia feels safe again. Our smiles bring hope. And after all, we're the brokers of a promise, a promise that says if you, the community, call us, 24-7, 365, within four minutes. Who else offers that kind of service? We not only will care, you trust us, but we're going to give you hope that things will be better. And nothing's more powerful than hope. It fuels the soul to power itself to well-being. We are its broker, we are its agent, we are its sales force. 
Amazing what a little bit of polite civility, diffusion of anger, restoring dignity can do, even in the middle of civil unrest. Not about the flak vest. It's about the smile. So smile. Be nice. Remember how powerful and infectious that smile becomes and is, as it is inspires others. Safety, service, smiles, and science. In Darwin's word, it wasn't the strongest. It's not the strongest that survive. It's those that are most adaptable and adjust to a changing environment. Sound familiar? Slight pandemic. So, to wrap things up. What science has shown us is that tourniquets work. They save lives. EMS adapted and adopted. Science showed us that oxygen wasn't good all the time. We adapted and we adopted. Now the data, the science is showing us that we're making errors. We must adapt and adopt crew resource managers and cultures in a culture of safety. When science is showing us that we are burning out and we are killing ourselves, we must adapt and adopt a new mindset. Heads up, check up. And most important of all, when no one is looking, when no one is measuring, when no one's collecting the data, when no one's using evidence-based practices, we, we, we need to take control of our own destiny. We need to do the work, the research, to improve our profession, our patient care, and our self-care. Remember Bruno, safety, service, smiles, and let's make safety and science sexy. I'm Dave Page. I'm honored to be saving lives with you. Have a great conference. Thank you.